wow, this is getting really exciting. The possibilities of what this might mean for your own walk with God are just beginning to appear. Before we talk about how to obey the gospel, let's do a quick review. We've labeled the last step in the biblical plan of salvation, obedience. The Bible, in no uncertain terms and in a variety of ways without contradiction, universally teaches that obedience to the gospel precedes salvation, or the forgiveness of sins. As we've seen, this is how we save ourselves, by responding in humble obedience to the gospel of Christ. Remember, it's not works that saves us. It's the blood of Christ, the power of the cross, and a humble, submissive response to God's commands. So, what does it mean to obey the gospel? We're about to spend a good deal of time dissecting a very important passage of Scripture. This passage is loved and presented in nearly every church, but rarely understood or obeyed. Knowing what we know now, we'll be able to see the deeper, more vital directives and obey them, not simply acknowledge this passage of Scripture as one of the most important teachings of Jesus, but to take it seriously and actually obey it. You know this passage. It's called the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Have you ever struggled with spiritual doubts? This passage should be super encouraging. Consider the fact that the 11 remaining disciples were standing right in front of the resurrected Son of the living God, and the Bible, almost in passing, mentions that some doubted. Is that not amazing? What would you be thinking if you were standing in front of the resurrected Christ? Doubt doesn't seem to surprise God, does it? It's the actions that follow doubt he seems to be concerned with. What will you do despite your doubts? Will you run away or will you stay and obey? Let's set the scene just a bit more. Who's Jesus talking to? The apostles. So the commands are, are really directed to them for the moment, just exclusively, not, not to us. The Great Commission is a truly brilliant set of instructions. It contains only four basic commands, and here they are distilled down into simple subject-verb form. Go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them. The first command is direct and simple. It contains a subject, the implied you, and a verb, go. This means don't hang around here, get out, get away, leave this place, and do what I'm about to tell you. In this one-word command, Jesus is telling the apostles they must be evangelistic. Now, if they're not evangelistic, would they have been obeying Jesus' command? No. The second command, make disciples. This is a huge one. Jesus did not tell the apostles to go make believers. He didn't tell them to go make Christians. He used a very specific, very precise word, disciple. A disciple is a student or a learner. The word carries more weight than that. Today, we might use the word apprentice to better understand the depth of the relationship Jesus has with his followers. This type of student becomes like his teacher. He, he imitates the teacher to the best of his ability. Also implied here is that there's a process of making disciples, and that process takes work. I have an entire study devoted to this one topic of making disciples, and it's quite challenging. Here's a couple of thoughts from that series as they apply to our discussion today. Making disciples does not mean getting someone to make an emotional decision or commitment to follow Jesus and raising their hand in a church service or saying a prayer to be saved. Truly making disciples requires a little more effort. First of all, it's a one-on-one -on -one activity. Preaching can be effective for the masses, and they can respond correctly, but preaching in public where the lost people are, is that's not very effective. 
We need a personal outreach to friends, neighbors, and people we meet. When you find someone who's curious about Christ, you teach them the gospel, which includes their repentance before they make a commitment to Christ. This means you should probably have at least a little bit of a warm relationship with them. I mean, try telling someone that you're not really close to that they need to give up their job at the adult video store or break off that immoral relationship before they can become a disciple of Jesus and see where that gets you. Someone's got to help them understand what sin is. Someone needs to love them enough to tell them the truth. Making a disciple means that sin is confronted, not ignored. This is done with gentleness and respect, but in discipling churches, sin is addressed scripturally before someone wants to become a Christian. The next command, baptize them. Well, who's the them? Well, the disciples which the apostles have just made. The only person who's a candidate for water baptism is someone who's repented and is behaving like a disciple. The goal is to baptize people who are serious. Not everyone is. Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 comes to mind as a person who was baptized but apparently never repented. Like Simon, just because you get baptized doesn't make you a Christian or save your soul. As we have seen, there's far more to the plan of salvation than baptism. This part of the Great Commission certainly narrows down the qualifications for those who may be baptized. Finally, Jesus tells the apostles to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. That sounds like a pretty tall order. Jesus taught them quite a bit in three years. Let's think about this command for a moment just as it relates to the Great Commission and watch how this blossoms out and then gets super personal. If the apostles were to teach the disciples that they made everything Jesus commanded, would it not include what he's just finished teaching? And what was that? To go, to make disciples, to baptize them, to teach them to obey everything. If you think this through, it's absolutely brilliant. The second generation of disciples would have been taught exactly the same thing Jesus taught the apostles to do. So, what would the third generation be taught? Go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey everything they have just been taught, including the Great Commission. At the beginning of this series, I made a strong assertion that the biblical plan of salvation should not have changed over 2,000 years. It's my conviction this pattern is exactly what we should still be teaching. Anyone who wants to become a Christian should be taught it will be their responsibility to obey and teach others the Great Commission. If you're in a church which does not teach and practice this pattern, there's something missing. These four commands have been handed down generation after generation without alteration. It's never changed. Many churches laud the Great Commission, but very few put it into real practice and hold their members accountable for fulfilling it. The Great Commission is seen as a goal or an ideal, but not a requirement. Every person who calls themselves a Christian must be going, making, baptizing, and teaching. There's no other kind of Christian. When you find a church which actually holds its members accountable to biblical obedience, you'll find a growing, healthy church. Evangelism is not the pastor's or the evangelist's job. Evangelism is the job of the church member. If we're not evangelistic, at least at some level, we are in disobedience to the scriptures. Now, here's where it begins to get really personal. If a disciple is made, it would be reasonable to conclude that I should know the person who made me a disciple. In other words, who taught me the truths of the scriptures before I was saved. Remember, we're not talking about someone who gets us to come forward in a church service or pray a prayer. We're not talking about a person who guided you or counseled you after you believed in Jesus. We're talking about the person who sat down with you opened the Bible, and showed you the truth and called you to the biblical standard of obedience before you were saved. So let me ask you a question. Who made you a disciple? 
I can point back to a specific time and place and person who showed me the truth by opening the scriptures. He helped me understand sin and its consequences. It took effort on his part. He showed me from the Bible what was involved in obeying Jesus. He called me to a Matthew 28, 18 commitment and made sure I understood I would be involved in the activities of the church. I couldn't be a spectator. You see, a disciple makes another disciple by explaining and helping them obey the Great Commission. This has never changed. So again, who made you a disciple? This is Jesus' plan to evangelize the world, and it's absolutely brilliant. A disciple makes a disciple. Can this be any clearer? You see, if we're not about the business of making disciples, are we truly disciples of Jesus? As a side note, think about who does the baptizing. After the first generation, it's disciples who make the disciples doing the baptizing, not the preacher, the pastor, or the deacons. It's you. That sounds like fun. The Great Commission is a good litmus test to determine if we're actually doing the will of God. Jesus made it clear. We should be teaching the people we meet exactly the same thing he taught the apostles who taught their followers who taught their followers. So that's why asking the question, who taught this to you or who made you a disciple is such a personal, penetrating question. Studying the Great Commission brings up the issue of water baptism. There's a raging debate in the modern evangelical world that questions whether water baptism is necessary for salvation or the forgiveness of sins. Coming from that presupposed position that baptism is a work of man, the argument goes like this. We are not saved by works, and baptism is a work. Therefore, baptism is not necessary for salvation. This is an interesting topic. Let's do a little review and then talk about water baptism.